Well, hey there. Uh, we got a few more minutes till you guys get to experience Genesis, so uh, gonna need something for you guys to do. Hey, Ralph. Yo. The vision of this film, what are you hoping to accomplish? We're trying to show that the Bible is true, but also the science to yes. back it up. If we're gonna have a debate about science, can you please just be honest about it? Ologia presents The Science of Genesis, Paradise Lost. Part 7, Obituary Column. If you're new to the series, click on the I in the top corner to watch from the beginning. One of the things that, that really helps to convince people of the millions of years is that chart of the geological column. For anyone wanting to research more about this subject, it's worth noting that what Terry calls the geological column is more commonly known in geology literature as the stratigraphic column. While synonymous, searching geological column tends to return creation-themed literature, where a stratigraphic column tends to bring up geological science literature. Be sure to read both for a complete picture. Where you see the rock layers, and then you've got the timeline on the side with the millions of years, and then you've got the bottom-dwelling sea creatures, and then fish. I can see why Terry wants to make a distinction between bottom-dwelling sea creatures and fish. Fish are vertebrates, meaning they have a backbone. And there are no vertebrates until the Cambrian layers, so no fish in the Precambrian layers. These Precambrian layers are not merely a thin strip either. They actually account for more than 80% of the layers on Earth, from 4 billion years ago to about 540 million years ago. In terms of life, what we do find in these bottom layers are single-celled organisms, protoalgae, tube-like filamentous organisms, and stromatolite microorganisms. This is a far cry from the kind of bottom-dwelling sea creatures we observe today. Coral, squid, sharks, demersal fish, anglerfish, and all the crazy things marine biologists keep finding in the mostly unexplored depths. Fish and amphibians and reptiles and dinosaurs and birds and mammals and people. How did that geological column get developed? It was back in the late 18th and early 19th century. This is correct. The first practical application of stratigraphy and precursor of the column is considered to be William Smith's 1815 geological cross-section map of England and Wales. However, the principles of stratigraphy began at least 300 years earlier, including the work of Nicholas Steno, who came up with the law of superposition, which states that in undisturbed strata, the youngest layer is on top and the oldest layer is on the bottom. There are two primary subdisciplines in stratigraphy. Lithostratigraphy investigates the physical rock material aspect of the strata, like Steno studied in the 1600s and Johann Lehmann in the 1700s, putting forth the idea that groups of rocks tend to be associated with each other in a historical sense. The other is biostratigraphy, which compares the fossils within strata, starting at least a hundred years later with Smith's work. They started to use the fossils, certain fossils called index fossils, to date a rock layer. An index fossil is any animal or plant preserved in the rock record of the earth that is characteristic of a particular span of geologic time or environment. To be useful in the field, the fossil must be from a species that is distinctive or easily recognizable, abundant, have a wide geographic distribution, and have existed for a relatively short range of time. Some examples include ammonites, echinoid, graptolite, and trilobite. Index fossils are used as a guide to correlate strata around the globe. Since the type and amount of sediment laid down varies by region, common index fossils can infer that strata in different parts of the world, even those featuring different kinds of rock, should be considered of a correlating time frame. Index fossils can also be used by paleontologists in the field to make quick approximations without involving lab work. Since all known Narinia trendosa are from the Jurassic era, it's a reasonable working assumption that a layer of rock in the field with a Narinia trendosa fossil is Jurassic. That said, Terry's claim that index fossils are used to date a rock layer is an overstatement. In any academic endeavor, the age of the rock is ultimately determined by one or more forms of radiometric dating done when back in the lab. It is ultimately the age of the rock that is used to give an age to the fossil, not the other way around. Oh, well that rock layer is this old because we know that the rock layers that have those fossils are this old. Well, you might ask, how'd they know how old the fossils were? Good question. They didn't. They were making assumptions about the history of life. That assumption is just invalid. The age of fossils are determined by doing some form of radiometric dating on the rock the fossil is found in. The cast of the film does have concerns about the assumptions of radiometric dating, which we'll talk about in the next segment. But agree or disagree, there is an actual method used. It's not merely conjecture. Remember this? 
the geologic column. You were probably taught in school that each layer represents a different period of time and was deposited over millions of years. In reality, each layer is simply showing the order of how things were buried. Fossils are actually not the evidence of the history of life. It's the evidence of the death of all life during Noah's flood and how those things got buried. You would be hard pressed to find anyone who denies that the geological column represents the order of death of these plants and animals. This minor distinction is to introduce the idea that perhaps the flood merely overtook some groups of animals before other groups. This has some intuitive appeal as it seems large dinosaurs might have had a more difficult time scrambling to higher ground than nimble mammals and birds, so it might make sense to see birds at the top, then mammals, then reptiles, etc. But it's difficult to imagine that the ability to escape sorted the creatures as perfectly as it did. For example, you'd have to accept that every single flightless waddling penguin found high ground before every single much more agile velociraptor and that every single mammoth outscrambled every single flying pteranodon. Eric's Creation Today ministry has previously advocated for a form of hydrologic sorting, where perhaps the churning of the water somehow sorted the fossils by density, with the least buoyant creatures settling first to the bottom. But looking at clams alone, we see that the oldest are tiny, and they get much bigger in higher layers, not what hydrologic sorting would predict. Far more creatures are out of order than in order for this method to be valid. The hydrologic sorting phenomenon with rocks also creates a single gradiated layer, not the kind of obvious layer distinctions we observe. Sea creatures are found from the lowest to the highest layers. There are sea creatures all the way through the rock record. As evolutionary theory generally holds that life began in the oceans, and that we continue to observe abundant ocean life today, a biologist would find it rather unremarkable that ocean creatures would be found in each layer. Indeed, it would have been far more remarkable evidence for the flood story if the movie could have said that there were land creatures all the way through the rock record. But they couldn't, as this is simply not the case. There are no land creatures at all in the lowest layers. In fact, it's only in the top 20% that we start to find fossils of land dwellers. Obviously, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So while a lack of such fossils doesn't preclude the possibility, the truth of the matter is, that not a single squirrel, or cow, or sloth, or armadillo in any way got stuck or trapped in the lower 80% of the flood. No land creature was injured or sleeping or living in a cave when the flood hit. Not a single land animal died before the flood to have their corpse found in the lower layers. In fact, in his famous debate with Ken Ham, Bill Nye indicated that to find a single rabbit in the Precambrian lair would be enough to falsify evolution to his satisfaction. As yet, no such Precambrian bunny has been found. And we find sea creatures on the tops of all of our highest mountains. There are sea creatures on the tops of the Himalayas, the Alps, the Andes, the Rockies. How'd they get up there? Terry's correct that sea creature fossils can be found on the tops of mountain ranges. And this can seem curious at first, though the answer is surprisingly simple. First, we must consider how the mountain ranges form in the first place. Generally, they occur when the plates of the Earth's crust collide and create volcanic buildup and create some sort of uplift of the material of one plate rising over the other. This is not a controversial view. Even the preeminent Young Earth Creation Ministry, Answers in Genesis, whose founder and staff appear in the film, affirms that the ranges listed by Terry, the Rockies, Alps, and Himalayas, would have been flat regions before the flood, and were raised up during and after the flood as a result of tectonic plate collisions. Where a mainline geologist will say that this uplift process takes millions of years, a creationist group like Answers in Genesis will say it happened quickly, like a car crash. But both groups agree that the mountain ranges with marine life fossils were raised up from a once low position. So then, everyone agrees that the rocks that are now on tops of the mountains were once at sea level or lower. As such, the fossils found there needn't have traveled to the tops of the mountain on their own, but were instead raised up with the rest of the rock. Marine life tracks and evidence of plant growth and ecosystem interactions on these mountains help affirm that the fossils were deposited before the uplift. This is the view of mainline geologists and paleontologists and their creation counterparts alike, even though for some reason the film allows the viewer to infer that perhaps the waters of the flood carried the sea creatures up there. In fact, 75% of the Earth's land surface is made up of sedimentary layers, which are rock layers that are formed in water. Sedimentary layers can be formed in water, but the sediment can also form from wind, melting of glacial ice, sliding in response to gravity, and precipitation under low temperature and pressure at the surface. So not necessarily water, 
Sedimentary rock does comprise 75% of the land surface and over 90% of the ocean basins. However, by volume, the sedimentary rock shell is only 5% of the terrestrial crust and less than 1% of the Earth's total volume. The bulk is igneous and metamorphic rock. Geologists also confess that the world is riddled with massively eroded features, like the Grand Canyon in America, the Blyde River Canyon in South Africa, and the Caperty Valley in Australia. Even colloquially, the word erosion refers to the gradual destruction of something. There is a time element. The Grand Canyon, the Blyde River Canyon, and Caperty Valley are indeed all the results of many years of erosion, of small amounts of water slowly carving in roads. While it is true that soft materials can give way to large volumes of water, the kind of meandering twists and turns found in the Grand Canyon are observed only in processes taking millions of years, particularly with the type of stone involved. And yet, they still refuse to acknowledge a worldwide flood. The film doesn't specify, but it seems to imply a point of view that such erosion must have happened while Noah's flood covered the earth. But again, even answers in Genesis concede that the geological features we see would not be explained by the years of submersion. Instead, answers in Genesis hypothesizes post-flood scenarios involving water basins and rapid erosion. Even if rapid erosion adequately explained these geological features, bursting water basins have been known to happen from non-flood causes. Is it really a refusal to acknowledge the flood? Or does flood geology fail to explain everything we observe? If it interests you, I'd encourage you to investigate this topic further. But the film is moving on without giving details, so so shall we. Next on the Science of Genesis Paradise Lost Part 8 Dating Troubles Tap the subscribe button and the bell icon so you don't miss it. If you'd like to support the work of Pologia, please consider becoming a patron at the link in the description. Thanks for watching.